All right. Yes. Yep. We are good, I believe. I'm sorry. All right. Hello. Welcome. I'd like to share a little bit about wind power development and the potential for it in Mongolia. Uh, I'd like to lead off with three big takeaways from the presentation. Uh, one is that development in Mongolia is possible, but it will be difficult. Uh, a lot of complications going to take some creative financing. Uh, it's mostly because there are a lot of changes going on in the country. It is a developing country, so there's a lot of risk involved, not a lot of wind power at the moment. Uh, however, the resources are huge. So if a company can figure out these types of financing, it may be a great market to break into now. Uh, I mentioned these things up front because I've got a lot of information to go through. I'm going to move quick, uh, so I'll try not to lose you. Let's jump into the details. So we'll run over some quick background on Mongolia itself. We'll go over some of the potential for wind power development in the country. We'll talk about some current development going on in the country, uh, a quick evaluation of the proposed site, which we've dubbed UB South, and then a final recommendation for moving forward. So a little bit about Mongolia itself. Uh, it is a very big country squeezed in between two enormous countries. Uh, Mongolia is the least population-dense country in the world. 45% uh, of the population lives in the capital of Ulaanbaatar, uh, which I may refer to as UB. There are only 3 million people in all of the country, half of them being in Ulaanbaatar. Uh, so imagine taking all of Europe, kicking out everyone except the Swedes, and half of them stay in Stockholm. That's how sparsely populated this country is, which is great because then we don't run into anyone. Um, they are very vulnerable to climate change, so they're definitely seeing it. They've seen 2.2 degrees Celsius sea, uh, temperature rise over the past 70 years. And um, the nomadic people who live out in the country have definitely embraced renewables. This is a common sight. Yes, that is a yurt being powered by a solar panel. They also power them by these little wind turbines that you can drag out there with your yurt. And you just pick them up and move them around. Background on their electricity. Uh, they generate about 75% of their electricity from their own coal power. It is a very big coal state. They export a lot of coal, too. However they can't often support all of their own electricity and they end up importing about 20% of it from Russia, especially during those cold, harsh winters. And they lose a lot of the energy that they produce because they have these old transmission lines and they have to move power over very long distances. So going into the wind resources, they have a lot. The National Renewable Energy Lab in the U.S. Uh, estimated about 1,100 gigawatts potential across about 10% of the land area of the country. So there is a lot of room to work with. Uh, the specific site that I'll be talking about, we can generalize that to hundreds of locations around the country. Uh, the best sites are going to be on these exposed ridge tops that you'll see in some of the pictures that uh, can spot uh, average wind speeds of over 8 meters per second. Annual maxes usually happen in the late spring and in the fall, uh, and there is a large diurnal variation. So usually it's calm in the morning, gets very windy in the evening. As far as the physical environment, it makes up most of what is known as the eastern steppe. Uh, it's a very high, dry, and cold environment uh, with a lot of low ground cover, so it makes for good low surface roughness. Uh, the climate can be very brutal. Brutally cold winters uh, can be below minus 20 degrees C for weeks at a time. Uh, and large temperature variations day to day can go from a max of 10 to lows of negative 40 often. Um, as far as infrastructure goes, it is a developing country. There's not a lot out there. Most paved roads are in Ulaanbaatar or going to Ulaanbaatar. Even the road that connects Beijing to Ulaanbaatar isn't fully paved. So things to think about when loading large objects. As far as the power grid goes, so here we're looking at the central energy system. There are four energy systems in Mongolia. The central energy system uses about 95% of the power. Here we can see there are a handful of transmission lines mostly connecting to Ulaanbaatar there in the center. And our light green lines here are 35 kV lines, and the blue ones up here are 220 kV lines. 
As far as the regulatory environment, there is a desire for climate action. Uh, the people have noticed climate change and they want to break away from coal. Uh, the government passed back in 2005 the National Renewable Energy Program. They set a goal of reaching 20% renewables for their electricity by 2020. They're not even close to that, as we talked about. Um, and they're trying to get power to remote areas, which they've done much better at with those distributed solar panels. The government basically controls the transmission and distribution. Technically, they're independent industries. However, it's pretty much just turned into a bunch of monopolies. So any work with the transmission companies or distribution companies is pretty much just going to go through the central government. As far as energy tariffs, in, uh, in that renewable energy law, it demands 8 to 9.5 cents per kilowatt hour uh, that will go to wind power. So uh, yes, that is measured in U.S. dollars, which can be really good for investors that will help keep things stable. And the government is required to sign a purchase power agreement of at least 10 years, and it often ends up being a lot more than that. So taking a look at the natural environment, here's an image of that eastern steppe. We've got these long areas of grasslands with, with these exposed ridge tops, as I mentioned. So some things to look out for in terms of nature. Uh, there are 30 species of endangered birds in the country, uh, including this big goofball here, which is the great bustard. It is endangered. It has a very limited uh, range that it lives in, and it's a terrible flyer. It runs into things, so maybe why it's endangered. Um, the government has recognized 70 important bird areas. Uh, they're clearly marked, and as long as we can stay away from those, the Sulkit wind farm in their environmental impact assessment, they determine that the impact to the land itself and other wildlife uh, is limited as long as we stay away from these protected areas. So the financial environment, again, getting that real high um, cost of energy uh, at 9.5 U.S. cents per kilowatt hour, which is about five times the prices that American uh, operators are getting. And all the projects that have been licensed are, have been guaranteed that. Uh, development aid has been expanding technical and vocational skills throughout the country. They've gotten a lot of support from the Asian Development Bank to support that. Uh, and uh, we can sell certified emission reduction credits uh, to more developed countries like Sweden, which recently bought 630,000 of these uh, for about $5 million. So let's take a look at all this current development in this wonderful, great place for all this uh, wind power. That's all there is. There's, there's one wind park operating there right now. So we're actually we're going to take a look at the, uh, the salt kit farm a little later, but I didn't tell you the whole story. So there are a lot of challenges going on. Back in 2011, uh, the Mongolian uh, economy hit about 17% growth. It was fantastic, but it's been downhill ever since then. With the slowing economy, uh, a new government was elected last year, and they don't know how they're going to pay their bills next year because there is an impending debt crisis. With that slowdown, they don't have the tax revenues. The Mongolian Togrog has been inflating like crazy recently. Um, the energy market is probably going to be deregulated, and so we don't know what's going to happen with those, those real nice high energy tariffs. Um, and with the high cost of development in that undeveloped country, a lot of high risk equals high cost of finance. However, now that I've seen some of yours, it's not as high as it could be. So we're going to take a look at the Salkit wind farm uh, and see what kind of lessons we can learn about what they did. So the things that I know what they did, they used 31 GE turbines uh, for 50 megawatts installed. They had $122 million initial investment. Uh, got that nice high tariff for a 25-year pur purchase power agreement. We'll assume 20 uh, just to keep things even. We'll pay a 25% corporate tax rate, and I know they did get some help from the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Things I had to assume, um, $1.8 million per megawatt for the turbines, which will help in estimating our own costs. Uh, there is another project that was I know was financed 70-30, so I'll make the same um, 
assumption there. And based on some numbers from the Diacor report, I looked up uh, a similar economy, like Italy's would give a whack of 9.6. Uh, yeah. Low growth, high debt, something like that. Uh, O&M costs range from 6 to $15 per megawatt hour per year and added in a generator degradation of 0.6% per year. So things are not looking good for this country or for this, uh, this company here. Since they've been operating for the past three years, I have to assume that my assumptions were bad and they're not actually hemorrhaging money. So this is probably a bad assumption because it is a developing country. They probably did things a little differently. What I recently found out is they did things very differently. The company that owns it actually fronted half of the initial costs. They also got investment from the turbine provider and from development banks. So that really changes things. Now, if we take this case again and look at it in a way that, let's just say they're trying to build a foothold, they're not looking to make a lot of money, just trying to beat inflation with this project. It, uh, it looks a lot better, um, still not terribly profitable, but it might be able to be done. So we're going to take that assumption when we analyze the UB South project. So choosing the site, uh, found this wind resource map uh, from a Spanish modeling company, had this nice region just south of the city at about seven and a half meters per second average. Um, that also happened to be right in between these two 35 kV lines and about 20 kilometers south of that 220 kV line. Actually, the Sulkit farm is plugged into this 35 kV line right there. Here's our wind profile, real nice and smooth because we just made it up. Um, the data there is not great. We had to assume about seven and a half meters per second average and then just built a Rayleigh distribution around that, which might be a little low for the three megawatt turbine, um, but as we'll see, it, it's not a terrible fit. So some of the parameters, we're going to use 19 Vestas V90 turbines for a total of 54 megawatts at 80 meters hub height, $121 million initial investment, um, costing about $2.1 million per megawatt, which is on the upper range of development, um, but not unreasonable. Going to get that high tariff, and then assuming 50 to 50 debt ratio, um, and then loans provided by the turbine provider and development banks. Again, no one's looking for a profit here. We're just going to see if we can at least not lose a whole lot of money. So actually, things aren't terrible. Um, with our own investment of over $60 million, payback time inside the project lifetime, uh, NPV is positive, and an IRR of 3.1%. Beats inflation, but not by much. So I wanted to look a little forward and try to see what would be a good investment to actually make a little bit of profit here and what could be our starting parameters. So some new assumptions. Um, I assumed brought down the turbine uh, price uh, so it makes up actually 65% of the project cost, whereas at Sulkit, I assumed it made out about 51% of the project cost. Assuming Vestas is going to help us out, um, and they're going to be looking for 8% returns. The development organization is looking for only 5%. And see if our own investors um, will look for 8%. We'll see uh, what kind of specifics we'll need. Making the same assumptions about the wind park itself. So our initial cost of the whole project um, at about $87.7 million U.S., Cost per megawatt, about 1.54 on the lower end, but within a, a reasonable range. A turbine cost of $1 million per megawatt, which is only slightly lower than what we had already assumed for the V90, and then an IRR of 7.23. So as we can see here, it actually can be moderately feasible if we can bring down those initial investment costs just a little bit and if we're able to front a lot of the money. So. I recommend that we look for further information, get better wind resource data out there, um, and look closer into development here. If the development company can make up 50-50 financing, can come up with a lot of the money on their own, 
uh, is able to secure low-cost development organization financing uh, from a development bank like the EBRD or the Asian Development Bank. Locate an interested turbine manufacturer. Vestas actually just signed uh, another contract with Clean Energy, the same company that runs the salt kit wind farm. Maybe uh, Enercon or Siemens wants to break into this market too. And, um, and then, of course, assuming the Mongolian economy stabilizes. Signs are looking good right now, but something definitely to keep an eye on. So if we can match these, I suggest that we go try to exploit that great resource out in Mongolia. Thank you. What can I answer? So uh, we ended up assuming uh, seven and a half meters per second. And then, and then Jose built a distribution for me right there. That would be great, but I have no idea. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, from the resource map, um, yeah, so we do have some darker areas here down in the south. I think this is in the Gobi Desert where the Sign Sand Project, I think they're exploiting this. Um, these ridges up here are going to be up in the Altai Mountains, probably going to be really difficult to reach. And close by, I tried to pick the darkest area that I could uh, right along this ridge here. Um, so that would that would put us around seven to eight meters per second. However, um, the the Salkit farm, which is right about there, which I found out after I picked my site actually, um, they have measured that they're getting an average of about eight point two meters per second. So I, I think our our seven point yeah, very possible, but there's just there's just not a lot of data out there right now. Mm -hmm. uh, I just worked with uh, the distribution that I had. Um, it would probably be useful to go back and, and maybe build a new distribution based on, based on that 8.2. That would probably help. But no, I, I did not explore that. <sighs> I lost you, didn't I? I'm sorry. <laughs> Ata? So um, so for this, uh, this was my initial investigation. I just wanted to see if we could beat inflation. And as I mentioned, uh, the, the payments do come in U.S. dollars, so we don't have to worry about Togdrog inflation. We have to worry about U.S. dollar inflation, uh, which is about 2%, so I just used 2%. Um, so for the UTP, you use inflation as USD? Yes, yes. So I, I just, I was assuming that the companies getting involved here are not looking for a huge profit. They're just looking to break into the market. That's what I'm saying is I, I'm assuming that those investors are not looking for much. They just want to get involved. So that, that was why I just started looking here and then, and then went back, um, and then these would be the premiums I did for the second round. It would be five or eight percent. Kind of, kind of had to ballpark it. I, I actually I don't know <laughs> what we would really want. Uh, the customers are paying in Togdrog, and they're paying significantly less than the the nine and a half cents per kilowatt hour, and the government is making up the difference. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's why they're, they don't know how they're going to pay their bills. 
<laughs> so it, if things stabilize, which it looks like they, they are getting better, uh, this system might work out well. But um, the, the Togdorg actually, it had a spiral this summer where it lost about 10% of its value against the dollar just rapidly. So these things got way more expensive quickly. All right. Well, thank you very much.